We all need the ability to communicate private information without fear of anyone eavesdropping. But designing a foolproof system for this isn't easy. In today's episode of Kiss Kid in the Classroom, we'll talk about how something called quantum key distribution can help. Welcome back to Kiss Kid in the Classroom. In the series, we'll cover topics you might encounter in a quantum computing related university course. Each video comes with an interactive module linked in the description, so make sure you check that out. Today, we'll venture into the realm of quantum cryptography. Cryptography is the study of techniques for secure communication. This is incredibly important to many parts of our lives. Every time you use a password to log into a website, send a digital payment, or when governments transmit military intel, it's all done through some cryptographic protocol so that an eavesdropper can't learn our secrets. But there's a tension here. How do we ensure that the person we want to communicate with can understand our message, but nobody else can? Historically, cryptographers have come up with a lot of different protocols to try to make their messages as immune from eavesdroppers as possible. Sometimes the two parties that want to securely communicate agree upon some code beforehand that hopefully is so complicated that an eavesdropper wouldn't be able to crack it. But as people like Alan Turing and other wartime code breakers have shown us, even the most complicated codes can be cracked. Ideally, we'd like to send messages that are encrypted in such a way that there's absolutely no pattern and no way that an eavesdropper can understand without also having a secret random key that only the sender and the receiver know. But then we open ourselves up to a new vulnerability. How can we send this key and be sure that nobody intercepts it? In 1984, Charles Bennett and Gilles Broussard came up with a method to securely send a key with quantum bits, which is now called BB84. The key feature of these quantum bits, or qubits, that enables this protocol is that they obey the uncertainty principle. You can't measure a quantum system without disturbing it. Today, we'll start with an example of a simple cryptographic code. Then I'll show you how quantum key distribution and the uncertainty principle can enable us to use nearly uncrackable encryptions. I'll walk you through the BB84 protocol in detail, and finally, we'll run it on a real quantum computer. First, let's start with a game you might have seen before called a cryptogram. You're given a sequence of seemingly random letters, but by using your knowledge of patterns in the English language, you can substitute one letter for another to make sense of the message. Here's an example. This is a secret message with a simple substitution cipher. So all the R's represent one letter, M's represent another, and so on. If you want to try your hand at solving this yourself, pause the video now. It turns out that this message was encrypted using a very simple cipher called the Caesar cipher, where the alphabet is just shifted by a certain number, in this case, nine. So A becomes J, B becomes K, C becomes L, and so on. The longer the message, the easier it is to see the pattern. So with a message as long as the one we're given, the Caesar cipher, or any other cipher that just substitutes one letter in the alphabet for another, is pretty simple to crack. A more secure way to encode a secret message is with a so-called one-time pad. With a one-time pad, you can have a different shift for each letter in the message. You just need to tell your friend what the shift was on each one so they can decode the message. This list of shifts is called the key or the pad. It's called the one-time pad because it's used once, then discarded. If it's used more than that, patterns will emerge, which could make the encryption crackable. With the one-time pad encryption, both the encrypted message and the key individually are just a random string of nonsense but when you put them together, you see a secret message emerge from the noise. Let's do a short example. Say I have already created and sent my friend this one-time pad, which is usually written in binary. And then I want to send the message, I love quantum. Then I would encode the message using the one-time pad like this. 
First, we convert the letters in our message to binary. Each letter, A through Z, will correspond to the numbers 1 through 26, written in binary. So A will be 00001, B 00010, C 00011, and so on. And then a space will be just all zeros. Then this is what the message becomes. We encode the message by performing an XOR between each bit in the message and its corresponding bit in the one-time pad. If you haven't seen XOR before, it stands for exclusive OR. The XOR between two bits will be one if only one of the bits is one, and zero if they're either both zero or both one. So the first set of five bits in the encoded message becomes one, zero, zero, one, one. I'll leave the rest of the XORs for you to do on your own. But the point is, this message is now just a random string of zeros and ones with no pattern. It's completely indecipherable by anyone who doesn't have the one-time pad that we use to encrypt the message. So what have we learned so far? Some encryption schemes are better than others, and some can be inferred by a smart person looking for patterns in the encrypted message. But a truly random key that shifts each letter in a secret message a different random amount cannot be inferred because there are no patterns in the message. The only vulnerability in a scheme like this is making sure that the key that was used to encrypt the message does not fall into the wrong hands. Here's where quantum key distribution comes in. By using qubits, Bennett and Brassard came up with a way for two parties to agree upon a key and be reasonably sure that a third party wasn't secretly listening. This BB84 protocol is a little complicated, but we'll walk through it step by step. For this explanation, let's bring back our old friends, Alice and Bob. The protocol starts with Alice preparing a set of qubits to send to Bob. These qubits contain the information that will become their shared one-time pad, or key. Alice first generates two random sequences of the same length. One is a random sequence of zeros and ones, and the other is a random sequence of x's and z's, representing the basis in which she will prepare her qubits. Then she'll prepare each qubit in a quantum state according to the combination of the basis and the bit value shown in this chart. So, if the bit is zero and the basis is z, she'll prepare the qubit in the zero state. Or if the bit is one and the basis is x, she'll prepare it in the minus state. If you're not sure what these bases and quantum states are, that's okay. The main point you need to know is that measurements in each basis only ever have two possible outcomes, zero or one for the z basis and plus or minus for the x basis. If you measure the state zero in the Z basis, you will always get zero. But if you measure that same state in the X basis, you'll get a random result, either plus or minus, each with 50% chance. So Alice might prepare a string of qubits like this, where here is the random string of zeros and ones, and here is the random string of Xs and Zs. So the first element in each of her two sequences was zero and x. So that means she'll prepare the first qubit in the plus state, and so on. Once she's prepared all of her qubit states, Alice will send Bob these qubits, and Bob will randomly choose between x and z as the basis in which to measure each one. So we now add some rows to the chart to represent Bob's choices and measurements. So here are Bob's measurements and basis choices, and here are his measurement results of the qubits that Alice sent him. Finally, Bob can convert each measurement to a bit using the same table that Alice used to prepare her qubits. When he measures the zero or the plus state, he assigns the bit value zero, and where he measures the one or the minus state, he puts a one. So Bob's final bit string is this final row. 
Note that when the bases of Alice's preparation step and Bob's measurement step match, then their bits will match too. But if Alice chooses to prepare Z and Bob measures in X or vice versa, then Alice and Bob's corresponding bits won't necessarily be the same. So a way they can both agree upon a bit string for their one-time pad is by calling each other up and telling each other which bases they used for each qubit. When the bases match, they keep the bit, and when they don't, they throw it away. So in this case, Alice and Bob will both agree upon a bit string of 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. How does this scheme protect against unnoticed eavesdroppers? Well, let's see what happens when such an eavesdropper, named Eve, intercepts the qubits that Alice sends to Bob. She doesn't know what state these qubits are in or how Alice prepared them. So, thanks to the uncertainty principle and something called the no-cloning theorem, she can't just make an identical copy of the qubits to pass along to Bob. If she could, then she would be able to eavesdrop without detection. Instead, she guesses a basis in which to measure each qubit, measures them, and then prepares a new set of spoof qubits to send along to Bob. There are other sneakier ways that Eve could try to learn about the qubits, but none of them get around the uncertainty principle, so we'll just assume this straightforward method of eavesdropping. Here's a chart describing Alice's preparation, Eve's interception, and Bob's final measurement. So now, when Alice and Bob talk on the phone to compare their bases, they'll decide to keep these bits for their key. But the bits don't match. This is because Bob was measuring qubits that Eve prepared, not the original qubits that Alice had. If they compare a subset of the bits in their bit strings with one another, they'll see that some don't match and assume that there must have been an eavesdropper. So, since Eve was discovered, Alice and Bob will throw away their bit strings and start the protocol all over again. But if Eve hadn't listened in, and the subset of the bits that Alice and Bob compared matched, then they could go ahead and use the remaining bits that they didn't compare as their shared key. Once Alice and Bob have a shared key, then Alice can send encrypted messages to Bob, and Bob is the only one who can decrypt them using the key. Now that we've gone through the protocol, let's try it on a quantum computer. There are a couple things to keep in mind for this experiment. First, BB-84 is really only useful if Alice and Bob are far away from each other. For the experiment we're about to do, Alice and Bob are on the same quantum chip. So this experiment won't be useful for exchanging private information, but it's still a good conceptual demonstration of BB-84. Second, real quantum computers have noise. So even if Alice's preparation basis matches Bob's measurement basis, and there was no eavesdropper, there's still a small chance that they will measure different bits due to errors in the quantum computer. When they're comparing their bit strings to check for eavesdroppers, they need to have some tolerance for errors before they conclude that an eavesdropper must have been messing with them and they throw the whole key out. Now, with those caveats, let's start with an experiment with no eavesdropper. First, we randomly generate three different bit strings each with 20 bits. The first is Alice's initial bit string. The second is a list of bases in which Alice will prepare her qubits. Here we've chosen zero to represent the Z basis and one to represent the X basis. The final list is the bases in which Bob will measure each qubit. Based on those three lists, we can make a circuit diagram with instructions for Alice's preparation and Bob's measurements. All qubits start in the zero state. So to prepare her qubits in the Z basis, Alice either does nothing for the zero state or applies a not or X gate shown as the blue boxes labeled X for the one state. To prepare in the X basis, she applies either a Hadamard gate, which takes zero to the plus state, or a not gate followed by a Hadamard to prepare the minus state. Then she sends the qubits to Bob. The next set of boxes in the circuit represents Bob's measurements. To measure in the Z basis, he doesn't need to apply any more gates, he just measures, which is shown by these gray boxes. 
To measure in the X basis, he first applies a Hadamard, and then he measures. We'll run this circuit using the Kiskit runtime primitive sampler, and the output is Bob's bit string of measurements. Then we can compare Bob's bit strings to Alice's initial bit string, throwing out the bits where their bases didn't match. And we see that they both get the same key. Remember, this is real hardware, so there occasionally might be a bit that should match but doesn't. In this case, all the bits match, but if you run this again on your own, you could get an error. But as long as the fidelity is close to one, Alice and Bob can be reasonably sure that there was no eavesdropper. Now let's see what happens if Eve intercepts the qubits. Now we have two circuits. The first shows Alice's preparation and Eve's interception and measurement. The next shows Eve's preparation of the spoof qubits and Bob's measurement. We can run these circuits as before, then see what Alice and Bob would get when they compare their bit strings. This time, they get a fidelity of 0.6 repeating. This is way lower than can be explained by noise on the quantum computer. So they conclude that Eve was eavesdropping. Quantum computing is well known and often hyped for its potential to solve hard problems. But quantum communication and cryptography often get much less attention, even though the potential that quantum can offer in these areas is equally significant and exciting. Today, we discuss the earliest discovered protocol for quantum key distribution, which is practically immune to undetected eavesdropping. If you want to try your hand at sending an unbreakable code with a quantum certified key, head over to the module linked in the description. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.